Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending our webinar, Trending Events in Education Law. Um, I wanted to remind you that this is part two of a three-part uh, series on legal and legislative um, updates um, for education law. And uh, it's being presented by the Education Law Group at Retzel and & Andrus um, and Retzel Consulting uh, Solutions. Um, I wanted to also remind you that part three of our webinar will be on December 18th, so please mark your calendars. My name is David Hurt. I'm a shareholder at Retzel and & Andrus, and today I'm joined by Sherry Warner and Aaron Ross. Sherry is of counsel at Retzel and & Andrus um, and is also the director of Retzel's, uh, Retzel Consulting Services in our Columbus office. Sherry specializes in lobbying and government relations, and she has over 25 years of experience in politics, associations, and government, and she also has expertise in operations and management, strategic planning, contract review, legal compliance, and revenue generation. Aaron is an attorney in our Columbus office. Aaron has extensive experience with administrative hearings, investigations, and advising on employment and discipline matters for public sector employees. He also specializes in school-based and administrative investigations. And following uh, the presentation of today's segments, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions that hopefully we can answer for you. Um, please enter your questions in, in the Q&A box in the lower part of your screen. Um, I did wanna remind you again that this webinar is being recorded and both the recording and the presentation slides will be shared after today's session. Um, so please look for an email from us uh, with, with details on how to obtain that information. Sherry will begin our session this morning by providing us with the latest legislative updates. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, the session that I'm going to discuss is lame duck and what's to come. Uh, and what I can say in that space is we're not really sure, but we are in the middle of our election cycle. And after the November election, the General Assembly generally comes back in and has a lame duck session that can be a little crazy as a lot of things oftentimes get cobbled together at the last minute to get them across the finish line. This year is a little unusual as we're not very sure who is going to be, whether we're going to have a very robust lame duck or whether there's not going to be much of any lame duck. And that is all kind of dependent on what happens with our speaker's race, which continues to bubble under the surface on the Republican side. There is really no expectation that the Democrats could take control. So we will again be with a Republican General Assembly uh, going into our next seat, our next year. And our Senate President, Matt Huffman, is actively challenging the current Speaker, Jason Stevens, to take control of the Ohio House. So with those two at odds, lame duck could be very robust or it could be a dud. But if it is robust, what we would expect things we are watching our House Bill 8, which is the Parents' Bill of Rights. It is sponsored by uh, Representative Swearingen and Carruthers in the, uh, on the House side. It has passed the House and it is currently sitting in the Senate where it has received significant amendments. I'm not sure the House is actually uh, in agreement with some of those amendments, but what this bill would basically do is it implements or requires districts to work with, uh, with parents, providing them with the information on um, uh, curriculum, providing information on what's being taught, how it's being taught in the schools. The other big issue is that it prohibits any type of sexuality or gender uh, uh, education in grades K through three, and then above K through three, it would have to be age appropriate. So it is a commonly referred to as a don't say gay bill. It is also very similar to the bill we saw passed in Florida a couple of years ago. Other things that we are watching is some attempt to reform property taxes. As you all are aware, there has been quite a bit of uh, conversation about how high taxes have gotten after our reappraisals. And so there is some push to tinker around the edges a little bit, maybe increasing um, homestead exemptions or adding additional populations to the ad exemption. We'll have to see where that's at. The religious instruction bill has received quite a bit of press. I don't know that it's going to get across the finish line. They may be choosing to back off. 
but it certainly is one we will be watching. And then moving forward, the uh, Office of Budget and Management has revised estimates, and those budget uh, estimates have been lowered. So we may have to see a budget correction bill to make sure that in the last six months, the uh, state stays in a balanced budget. Uh, so that could it, it require some cuts. I haven't heard anything about that, but that would be the time for a budget corrections bill. And also with everything going on uh, around transportation, particularly the lawsuit again from Dave Yost against the Columbus City Schools, they may try to slip something in to address transportation challenges that districts uh, that they view charter schools or private parochial schools having because of districts inability to provide transportation for whatever reason. I know in many cases it is a lack of drivers, a lack of, of uh, the buses, primarily the lack of drivers, which is driving uh, this this challenge, but I could see them trying to address it in lame duck. So those will be issues we will be looking for. Going into the next General Assembly, um, obviously the big thing coming forward will be the state's annual uh, biannual budget. We should see that in the mid part of February. Things we think will be involved, obviously, maybe they are due to implement the third phase of the fair school funding formula. We will be looking for them to have cost updates in place. Hopefully they will continue to do that. We also will be looking at what they continue to try to do with regards to property taxes. Again, this has been a conversation where I think they could address some tinkering in lame duck, but they may try to make some more wholehearted um, changes during the budget cycle next year. And one of the things we will be watching for is as they reduce the property tax liability, on individuals who own property in the state of Ohio, who is going to fill that gap? And is the state gonna come in and uh, make up all of that revenue to the local taxing districts, or are they going to be required to uh, assume that burden themselves? So that will be something we're watching in lame duck, I'm sorry, in the budget. Um, accountability and academic improvement, obviously are both topics that seem to come up in every budget. Um, we do know that they are looking at how to structure things to make math changes and to improve math scores uh, as they did trying to improve reading scores or language arts scores in the last budget cycle. Um, we don't anticipate that to be a curriculum mandate, but we do anticipate steps being taken to try to have districts uh, give them the tools to improve math scores going forward. And again, we will be dealing with the transportation issues. I'm sure there will be language in the transportation budget, uh, maybe additional requirements, maybe additional penalties, uh, maybe additional resources or changes to how transportation is done. But all of that is uh, things that we will be watching for in the next budget cycle. I also will not be surprised if there are some additional changes to the voucher program. Uh, it could be some minor expansions into non-chartered non-pubs. Um, I don't know that they will go that far. It may be some expansion into homeschooling, but I do think that you're gonna continue to see very, very strong support for school choice by this General Assembly. The last thing that we are expecting in the next General Assembly is a request by the State Teachers Retirement System to increase the employer contribution. Um, this will be done along with some other systems that are, are requesting employer contributions. Uh, that is a uh, difficult um, discussion to have because obviously if we increase the employer contributions, we significantly increase the costs of all of our district's budgets. So we will have to see what they are looking at doing, how they are doing it. And with that, I do anticipate the General Assembly requesting some form of pension reform, maybe changes to the board or who sits on the board, uh, maybe additional requirements that should boards request more funds, they have to manage them in a specific way. I am sure that many of you are aware that STRS has been involved in some challenging controversies of late with some of their board, their board members being split into two different camps what that is gonna look like. I think that will continue to bubble and brew and may see a legislative fix in the next General Assembly. Um, so we'll be watching for all of that as it impacts both our districts from a financial uh, perspective, but also all of you as members of STRS. So with that, I am going to pass the uh, next session on to what I'm sure many of you are here to listen to, which is, 
Many of the new legislative requirements, which passed in the end of June, those are coming to uh, to fruition and you're going to have to start complying with them. So Aaron is going to be discussing the new legislative requirements and the important deadlines you have to meet to stay in compliance with state law. Aaron. Thanks, Sherry. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Sherry said, I've got the new legislative requirements and important deadlines um, and so the, the first one that, that we're going to talk about are the religious expression days. So this was originally introduced in Senate Bill 49. Uh, it was, this was the enact the religious expression days act. Um, the legislation was passed by House Bill 214. Um, and so we'll talk not only about religious, religious expression days, but, but there's another provision that we'll talk about second, um, in House Bill 214. So this is a pretty big bill for education. It was signed by the governor on July 24th and then um, is effective October 24th of 2024. So the religious expression days require a, a policy that reasonably accommodates sincerely held religious beliefs and practices. Now, um, this is kind of going to be a bit of a theme throughout this is requiring boards here to adopt policies um, that are that are kind of prescriptive and pretty well laid out by the by the General Assembly. So this one will allow for three excused absences for for these days each school year. Um, under the policy, schools are not allowed to impose any academic penalty as a result of the absence. Consider those absences in determining um, absence hours for parental notifications and then unreasonably withhold or deny an excused absence for any religious holiday, festival, or observation. So they do provide a little bit of guidance here on, on, what, um, on what this policy has to, to entail. Um, so in certain situations, you have to provide alternative accommodations for students who miss exams or other requirements. Um, that's if the student provides the, the school principal, and it is specific to, to the school principal, with written notice of up to three requested dates for alternative accommodations. Um, the written notice must be received within 14 days of school or if a transfer student within 14 days of that, uh, that student's enrollment. Um, the principal cannot inquire into, you know, what these sinc the sincerity of the religious beliefs, um, essentially you have to accept that at face value. They may, um, uh, the, the principal can reach out to the parent just to verify that the parent or the guardian is the one who signed this, um, but that's the extent of the verification that they can make for that. Um, the principal must require the teachers then to schedule a date and time to accommodate for the missed exams, and um, if absent for religious expression, allow those students to participate in extracurricular activities. So if it's a day that the student's out for that, they can still do anything like uh, uh, student athletics um, or, or any other sort of extracurricular activity. Um, in terms of this policy, it does have to be posted on the website and include a non-exhaustive list of major religious holidays um, that will be uh, um, considered um, and not unreasonably denied. Now, the Department of Education and Workforce is required to compile a list of major holidays, um, major religious holidays, and publish that on their website. I, I checked again this morning. That list has not been published as of yet, but keep an eye out for that. Um, the, the districts uh, or schools and districts should be able to use that list to develop their own. Um, then the policy has to be communicated annually. So this is gonna be a policy um, along with the procedures for requesting those accommodations. This policy is gonna be something that you're gonna wanna include maybe in your student handbook, or um, or being sent out at the beginning of the school year to to all of your students and and to the parents, um, and then there has to be a grievance procedure regarding the implementation. Now, there's not a whole lot of guidance in terms of what this uh, grievance procedure is really supposed to look like, um, but but some sort of appeal process um, from the super from the principal's decision should be included in that. So parents and students who feel that they have not um, who have have had their um, religious expression day denied have an avenue to um, to address that. Now, the one thing is um, 
the the policy provides for this 14 days, but the that's um, I, I think specific to those prior accommodations. There's wording in the legislation that says we should that that the religious religious expression days shouldn't be denied, um, and so even if students are you know making those requests after that time frame. Um, it's probably going to need to be approved um, regardless based on that, the kind of the general wording of that statute. Um, so along the same lines in House Bill 214, uh, we do have the beliefs, affiliation and ideals policy um, uh, that, that, that school districts are now required to adopt. So this was, like I said, also in House Bill 214, again, signed by the governor on July 24th. Um, and then the effective date of the legislation is October 24th, but the requirements of the legislation are that it, um, that the policy is, um, affect, the policy has to be adopted within 90 days after the effective date. So we're looking at January 22nd of 2025, um, for the district um, to to adopt this policy. Um, so the the policy here um, that the district has to to adopt is pretty prescriptive in the in the legislation. It essentially tells the district what the policy needs to say. Um, so the school district is not permitted to solicit or require an employee or applicant. Um, to affirmatively, affirmatively ascribe to or opine about specific beliefs, affiliation, ideals, or principles concerning political movements or ideology. Um, along the same lines, the school district cannot solicit or require a student to affirmatively ascribe to those specific beliefs um, or principles concerning political movements or ideology. Now, the really tough part about this statute and this requirement is that there's no definition for what what these political movements or ideology, um, uh, what what that means. There's no definition for political movements or ideology. So we're we're left kind of interpreting that for um, for you know our schools and districts. Um, you know when we're talking about it, ascribing, we're talking about attributing or thinking of as belonging to you, um, and so. This is, uh, you know, a policy that they have to adopt, but but the the definitions here of what these words mean, I, I think, is really um, going to be up to interpretation, um, and 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 because the the legislator just kind of left this up in the air. Uh, the other part of this is the school district shall not use statements of commitment to specific beliefs, affiliation, ideals, or principles. Um, for the evaluation of, uh, of employees um, and also for evaluations of students, right? So uh, you can't use those commitments to specific beliefs, affiliation, ideals, or principles concerning political movements or ideology as part of the academic evaluation of a student. Um, so what we're really getting at here is is coming from a neutral standpoint in terms of our evaluations of students, um, in terms of our um, um, teaching of students, right? So to provide a bit of an example here, because I think I think with this wording, it's really difficult to to figure out what we're actually talking about. So I think uh, abortion might be a good a good example here, right? We have two um very divided uh ideology on on abortion and and how it should be governed right so in terms of school right we can't be all or nothing um we have to um accept the that that the the this the statements of commitment regarding let's say abortion right um in an evaluation of students so if it's a test right the that statement can't be based on the, the student's grade, it has to be about the um, the development of the student's argument, more or less, right? So we're talking about, um, you know, in terms of abortion, right? Um, that that the student's development or the, 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 um, the person's, the employee's 
opinion on it can't be the basis for their their evaluation, um, whether that's employment evaluation or academic evaluation. Now, um, there are some um, like uh, that some exceptions here, right? So nothing in the act prohibits a school district's authority to require a student or employee to comply with federal or state law, um, including anti-discrimination laws, or take action against a student or employee for violations of those laws. So whether that's, you know, Title IX or Title VII um, or any other state laws. Um, nothing infringing upon an educator's academic freedom, um, an educator's ability to research or write publications about specific beliefs. So kind of getting to that First Amendment uh, aspect of this, right, that, that the teachers can write publications about specific beliefs, affiliation ideals, or principles concerning these political movements or ideology. Um, a school district's authority to consider an applicant for employment, for employment scholarship, teaching, or subject matter expertise in the applicant's uh, given academic field, um, and a school district's authority to uh, offer an established character education program. Um, so, so definitely some exceptions there in terms of um, the 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 reach uh, of this particular uh, statute. So one of our really big changes is to student data privacy. And Senate Bill 29, um, which was signed by the governor on July 24th, and again on October 24th, it's going to be effective. Um, it was a busy day on July 24th for, for education. Uh, so this act is going to regulate the use of educational records and student data by school districts and uh, what we define as technology providers. Um, and it's really going to, to matter in terms of two aspects here. So the first is going to talk mostly about those technology providers and the relationship between the school district. And then the second part of it is, is more about that student data and what we can and cannot monitor. And if we do um, look at that, our responsibilities in following up with parents. So the first part of this is it adds educational support services data to the list of uh, records that are not public records under Ohio public records law. Um, and so it does provide an educational support services data definition um, to help us understand what, um, you know, what specifically they're looking at here. Um, so it's going to be data on individuals, you know, collected, created, maintained um, either by a school district um, yeah, or by the school district or the, the or a program administered by a school district. Um, and it's the, if the program is designed to eliminate disparities and advance equities and educational achievement for youth by coordinating services available to participants, regardless of the youth's involvement with other government services. So, um, this is going to be an exception to the public records law, or, or it's specifically not a public record under the public records law. So um, that's uh, something to keep in mind as, as people make you know, public records requests. Um, so uh, another change is to revise code 3319.31. Um, and this is our statute that provides for the discipline of licensed educators. So it's going to add using or releasing information that is confidential under state or federal law concerning a student or student's family members uh, for purposes other than student instruction. So really specific there. Um, in terms of actual change, uh, I, I don't know that this is really going to change any sort of discipline. Um, you know, most of this confidentiality is covered um, under the licensure code of professional conduct for Ohio educators. Um, and so uh, putting this in here, um, I think really just uh, emphasizes that, um, but but not really adding anything in terms of, you know, additional uh, uh, um, responsibilities for educators. That confidentiality piece has been there um, for for quite some time in the licensure code. So this um, legislation uh, adopts 3319.326, uh, 
and it requires technology providers to comply with Chapter 1347 with regard to the collection, use, protection of data as if it were uh, a school district. Um, and, and so, you know, big statute there, um, but, but in terms of that, um, we're talking about informing a person who is asked to supply personal information for a system, whether the person is legally required to or, re or may refuse to supply the information. Um, and, and there's, there's, there's a lot in this in 1347 that now will, will um, apply to those technology providers, right? Um, but these are already standards that the the school district and schools must comply with. So we're just moving those to the technology providers as well. Um, thankfully, uh, good definition here for technology provider uh, means a person who contracts with the school district to provide a school issued device for student use uh, and creates, receives, or maintains educational records pursuant or incidental to its contract with the district. Now, the term school issue device, when you read it, it really sounds like a physical device, right? We're talking or we're thinking computers, um, you know, our Chromebooks, but the, the, um, the statute actually defines it much, much more broad than that. Um, and it means hardware, software, devices, and accounts that a school district acting independently or with that technology provider provides to an individual student for that student's dedicated personal use. So yes, it's going to include those Chromebooks that, that students have, um, but it's also going to include all the software that's on them um, and the uh, accounts that we're setting up for them. So whether it's, you know, through your power school and the, the, the different accounts that the students are using, um, uh, you, you know, to, to access educational material, um, or if it's your, if you use Google and you have a Google suite uh, apps, right, those different accounts that are associated with that, those are included um, in this definition of school issued device. So uh, the, the statute requires technology providers to cooperate with a school district if a data breach occurs, um, and uh, which, which is a little bit duplicative here, right? Because we already have to comply with chapter 1347. Um, and so I think this is really just re-emphasizing um, this specific point. And uh, in our second se uh, section today, we're gonna talk about data breaches as well. So um, these two are kind of timely. Uh, so technology providers must disclose to the school district all of that information that's necessary to fulfill those requirements um, uh, in, in the event of a, a data breach. Um, and so, you know, they are required then to come to work with the district and provide that information so that the district can provide those notifications to uh, affected individuals. So pursuant to uh, 3319.32, um, within 90 days of the expiration of a contract, did I, um, the, the, the technology provider, um, has to return or destroy student records created, received, or maintained pursuant to or incidental to the contract. So um, if there's, you know, no reasonable belief that the contract is going to be renewed, right, the technology provider has to ex essentially um, give back that data or destroy that data. Now, um, in terms of these student records, right, um, the, if the district needs to make sure to have a copy of those student records if the technology provider is going to destroy them as um, as those are going to be, you know, records um, that they need to maintain pursuant to their um, uh, their records retention policy. Um, it also prohibits technology providers from selling, sharing, or disseminating educational records um, or using educational records for any per, uh, commercial purpose, including marketing or advertising to a student. Uh, it is really important to note that there is provision in here that says a commercial purpose does not include providing the specific services contracted for by a school district. So they're really trying to get at not um, the, the technology provider not using the information that they're obtaining from the school district to sell, 
um, a different product or something additional to the to the student or the parent. Um, also, the sharing or disseminating of those educational records, right? Um, so they can't, you know, sell all that student data that they have to a third party who's going to then, you know, use that to maybe, you know, uh, market to those students. Um, nothing in the division prohibits the technology provider from using aggregate information removed of that personally identifiable information for their uh, for the purposes of improving, um, maintaining, developing, supporting, or diagnosing the provider's site, service, or operation. So they can use um, that information in the aggregate to to essentially make their product better and and diagnose and and you know. Um, and identify trends. Now, oh, there are specific provisions that, that we need to be aware of here that require the contracts with the technology provider uh, to, uh, the, the, they have to include specific provisions. Um, so those provisions have to ensure the appropriate security safeguards for educational records and it must include a restriction on unauthorized access by the technology providers, employees, or contractors, and a requirement that, that uh, the technology providers, employees, or contractors may be authorized to access the educational records only as necessary to fulfill the official duties of the employee or contractor, right? So when we're working with these education or with these technology providers, we need to make sure that they have um, that those contracts have these specific terms in them, um, and that and 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 we also want to uh, likely you know make sure that we're they're addressing the student data aspect of um, when the contract ends, as provided a couple slides ago. You know that that ninety day destroy and um, the the uh, or return that student student records. So uh, for this policy, right, not later than the first day of August of each school year, the school district must provide parents and students direct and timely notice by mail, electronic mail, or other direct form of communication. So, you know, whereas in, in the religious expression days, we had this more generic term of providing this uh, information annually, this is really specific in terms of we need to be directly communicating this to the, the parents each school year. And, and, um, and so uh, what needs to be communicated is um, any curriculum testing, curriculum testing or assessment technology provider contract affecting a student's educational records. So it's got to include all of the following, identify each correct curriculum testing or assessment technology provider with access to educational records, identify the educational records affected by the curriculum testing or assessment technology provider contract, and include information about the contract inspection and provide contact information for a parent or student to direct questions to so somebody at the district who can answer questions regarding the technology providers access to a student's educational record. Um, the parents also have um, the opportunity must have the opportunity to inspect a complete copy of any contract with a technology provider. So in terms of our technology provider contracts right we need to um, not only be maintaining a list, um, but also identifying how those. Uh, technology um, companies are affecting educational records and then maintaining those contracts so that they can be, you know, in a form and fashion that 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 we can allow for the inspection um, by parents upon their request. So uh, the next part of this um, is is going to be found in a new statute 3319.327. And it's going to prohibit a school district or technology provider from electronically accessing or monitoring location tracking features of a school issued device. And remember, not just the the um, the school when we talk about school issued devices, um, that broad definition here of, of accounts, um, uh, devices, and um, and and computers, right? Like, so we're talking about much more than just a, a, a laptop or a phone. Um, 
So, so just keep that in mind as we go through this. Um, and then uh, any audio or visual receiving, transmitting, or recording feature of a school issued device. And then students' interactions with a school issued device, including but not limited to keystrokes and web browsing history. So, um, and and this is not just electronically accessing, but it's monitoring too. So we can't um, under this statute, school districts cannot electronically access or monitor these. So if we, you know, are having um, alerts coming from uh, students' use of uh, their their web browser, those are not going to be permitted um, to be electronically accessed or monitored. Those alerts are probably not allowed under this particular um, statute. So there are certain exceptions to this prohibition. Um, the If the activity is limited to a non-commercial educational purpose for instruction, technical support, or exam proctoring. So if the student is having issues with the, the, the device, right, we can electronically access or monitor it um, to help that student, um, you know, work through those issues. Uh, exam proctoring, right, if we're using a, um, a device or an account to uh, proctor an exam, those can be monitored. Um, and so that's our first exception. Uh, the second is if the activity is permitted under a judicial warrant, um, the school district or technology provider is uh, notified or becomes aware that the device is missing or stolen. Um, so if we are able to turn on and turn off tracking features to use to to identify um, uh, the location of a device, um, then then we can electronically access or monitor that in, in that situation. Uh, if the activity is necessary to prevent or respond to a threat to life or safety and the access is limited to that purpose. So, um, you know, maybe we have a missing student or um, uh, or something along that lines, so you can access that. Um, the, if the activity is necessary to comply with federal or state law, or the activity is necessary to participate in federal or state funding programs. So as an example, the Children's Internet Protection Act um, requires monitoring for all schools that participate in the E-rate program, which provides discounts on telecommunications, internet access, service costs, um, and, and internal connections. So um, under that, uh, the under that federal law, right, um, the policy must include monitoring um, the online activity of minors in, in order to receive those funds. Um, so we do have an exception um, for that uh, under under this new law, um, and and um, you know that is going to be monitoring and um, for you know. Um, like uh, pornography and sexual explicit material. Uh, so if a, if a district or technology provider generally monitors a school issued device, um, like, like we talked about um, in, in that last example, the Children's Internet Protection Act, um, if we're monitoring that all year, right, the district has to provide written notice of that monitoring to the parents of its enrolled students. Um, so, so that's going to be, um, you know, another notification that they have that the school districts have to provide if they're, you know, receiving funds under under that uh, federal statute and or federal program, um, and they're doing that monitoring. Um, and so that's for all of the all students um, need to be notified. All, all parents need to be notified of that. Um, and then. If one of the other ex one of the exceptions is triggered, the district is required to notify um, the the student's parent and provide a written description of the triggering of circumstance. This notice uh, must be sent within um, seventy two hours, unless the notice itself would pose a threat to life um, or safety. In, in this situation, the notice must be given. Um, within 72 hours after that threat has uh, ceased. So written notifications within 72 hours, if let's say we're accessing tracking information or web browsing history um, of a student, you have to send that description of the triggering circumstance to the parent within 72 hours. Um, and then that a little bit of flexibility um, 
if that would pose a threat to the life uh, or safety, um, then after that threat is over, 72 hours after that. Um, so Senate Bill 168, um, this is kind of a leg or a education legislative fix bill. There's a lot that, that's included in Senate Bill 168. Um, again, signed by the governor on July 24th of 2024. Um, the effective date of this one is October 24th and involves, like I said, numerous changes related to education. One of the big ones here is uh, re changes related to the Ohio teacher evaluation system. It amends um, RC 3319.111 and permits districts to use an alternative teacher evaluation framework um, that is created or adopted by the school district's Board of Education. Uh, the evaluation framework would be used instead of OTAS. Um, and uh, it still requires that consultation with teachers uh, employed by the board to develop that. Um, and then uh, some, some new licensure requirements. Um, let's see, it's going to lower the required degrees to a bachelor degree for a senior professional educator license and for a lead professional educator license. And then it allows the Department of Education and Workforce to adopt rules allowing individuals with bachelor's degree to obtain an alternative superintendent license or uh, an alternative administrator license. So uh, it's gonna be incumbent upon those rules being adopted, but a little bit more flexibility in that aspect as well. And then finally, um, amends uh, revised code 3313.984 um, requires uh, intra-district open enrollment lottery be conducted no later than the second Monday in June. Um, and so, the, the, the good thing about this for, for our districts that are doing those intra-district open enrollment um, is it's much more flexibility. The prior law required the lottery be conducted on the second Monday in June. So um, you had to do the, the lottery on that date under the previous law. And now, as long as it's done by that date, um, then the district is in compliance. Um, so I'm going to turn it over then to David for the uh, trending topics in educational law. Um, so, David. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah. Um, so for the trending topics portion of our presentation, we're going to be talking about the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, uh, mainly, well, both the act and the new regulations. Um, also, release time for students for religious instruction, um, addressing cyber attacks. Um, and then uh, we'll be talking about two particular uh, pieces of litigation um, that are better of interest, uh, certainly for, for school district personnel. So the Pregnant Workers um, Fairness Act, um, the actual law was effective last June, so June 27th of 2023, um, but the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunities Commission um, issued um, its final regulations to implement uh, the piece of legislation, and those regulations were effective uh, just this past June. Um, what you'll notice uh, pretty much right away is that um, the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, um, a lot of the language in it sounds a lot like the Americans with Disabilities Act, so uh, the provision of reasonable accommodations is a big part of the act and the regulations. Um, so the, the, the law and the regulations require covered employers to provide reasonable accommodations to a worker's known limitations related to pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions, unless the accommodation will cause the employer an undue hardship. Um, it's important to realize that the, the concept of an undue hardship um, is a fairly high bar. Um, most um, hardships or difficulties that an employer may face by providing um, a, a pregnant worker reasonable accommodations uh, likely will not be considered to be uh, undue hardship. And so those reasonable accommodations will need to be provided. Um, the, the law and the regulations uh, address employer obligations um, about the concepts of pregnancy, childbirth, or relate, related medical conditions. Um, you'll see here from the, the definitions of pregnancy and childbirth that, that those, those phrases, those words are defined fairly broadly. Um, and likewise, the, the phrase related medical conditions 
um, are are defined broadly as well, um, just because the word uh, relate is is a fairly broad term. The um, related medical conditions um, include um, lactation, miscarriage, stillbirth, and these other some of these other conditions listed on the slide. Um, the, the, the list of conditions in the regulations is meant to be non-exhaustive. Um, and again, to be a, a related medical condition for the purposes of this act, um, the, the condition just simply needs to quote unquote relate to the pregnancy or childbirth. Um, so, so again, that's a, a very broad term. Um, the, the main issues that I've been advising districts on um, in, in terms of the, the legislation and the, the regulations have to do with um, employees requesting extra break time um, to express milk um, to store and later feed to their child at home. Um, and also addressing, um, you know, wh where that can be done. So um, it, it's pretty clear from the law and the regulations that the employer must provide extra uh, break times to express milk uh, to, a, um, to a mother, um, and that must provide a, a, a private area to do that that has uh, running water, electricity, um, certain needed surface area for, for equipment. Um, and uh, also, it's important to realize that 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 area that's designated for um, a mother to express milk um, is not permitted to be a, a restroom. the The law and the regulations talk about the the law applying to a quote unquote qualified employee. Um, so the first part of qualified of the definition of qualified employee in the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act and regulations um, sounds a lot like the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's an employee who either with or without reasonable accommodations um, can perform the essential functions of the position. Um, but what's interesting about the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act and the regulations is that uh, an employee is also a qualified employee um, if the employee either with or without reasonable accommodation cannot perform an essential, an essential function of the employee's job description, but that that um, period of time where they cannot perform the essential function is quote unquote temporary. Um, and that there's an anticipation that the, the employee will be able to perform the essential functions in the near future. Um, and, and, uh, the the inability to perform uh, the the essential functions can be reasonably accommodated. Um, so that's a little bit more um, expansive than the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, some of the um, general types of accommodations that are considered to be reasonable accommodations under the Pregnant Pregnant Workers Fairness Act um, have to do with modifications and adjustments for the job application process for someone who's not yet an employee. Um, what you'll see the most, though, is the second item, um, modifications or adjustments to the work environment um, or the manner in which the, the employee is, to, is supposed to perform work um, if that limitation um, is, is related to the pregnancy. Um, and it's, um, and again, it, it can be a limitation that prevents temporarily prevents the, the employee from providing an, uh, or performing an, a, an essential function of the job. Um, so, um, you know, an example that you might see here is if you have a, a, a person employed as a custodian um, who's pregnant and that, that employee's physician says, um, you know, for the duration of the pregnancy, the employee is not supposed to be around a particular cleaning chemical. Um, but the use of that cleaning chemical is, is essential for that custodian to perform one of the essential functions of their job um, because it's temporary um, under the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. Um, a reasonable accommodation is going to be, um, you know, having someone else uh, perform the cleaning with that chemical that the, that the employee cannot be exposed to uh, for the duration of their pregnancy. Um, 
So again, this is uh, this is just a slide, I, I guess, to emphasize that um, you know this is one area of the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act that that does differ and is more expansive, more favorable to employees than the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I'm going to turn it back over to Aaron now um, to talk about a release time for students um, for religious instruction. Thanks, David. Um, <clears throat> so release time for religious instruction um, is found in RC 33 13.6022 um, and um, means release time means a period of time during which a student is excused from school to attend a course in religious instruction conducted by a private entity off school district property. So right now, um, uh, school districts have the ability to adopt these policies and many have. It arises out of the United States Supreme Court decision in Zorak versus Clawson. Um, this case uh, permitted a school district to have a student leave school for part of the day to receive the religious instruction. Uh, release time religious instruction must um, meet three criteria. The course must take place off school property, be privately funded, and students must have uh, parental permission. So in March of, of this year, um, Ohio House Bill 445 was introduced. And, and I think Sherry talked a little bit about this earlier. Uh, the bill seeks to amend section 3313.6022 um, of the revised code and require that school districts create this policy for release time for, for religious instruction. The big, um, the big, I would say, company or organization that, that we hear about in terms of release time is LifeWise Academy. Um, it's a non-denominational uh, religious organization, organization that's headquartered, headquartered in Hilliard, Ohio, so central Ohio here, enrolls approximately 30,000 students in more than 300 schools across 12 states. So it's got some pretty big reach, um, you know, Arkansas, Georgia, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia. Um, it's estimated to be in about 170 school districts in Ohio for this school year. Um, so it was founded by Joel Penton, and he's a native of Van Wert, Ohio, and a former Ohio State football player. Um, and, uh, you know, it's gotten some, some different um, responses, right? Um, the Catholic priests of St. Augustine Parish in Napoleon, Ohio, has urged parishioners not to participate in or fi financially support the program. Um, fearing that the Life Wives Academy curriculum could draw children away from the tenets of the Catholic Church. Um, then in fall 2023, there was a study done um, by an Indiana consulting firm, uh, Thomas Miller and Associates, and they found that the school uses, schools that use LifeWise have improved attendance and fewer suspensions. However, the validity of the study has been questioned by honesty for uh, um for Ohio educator or for Ohio education, excuse me. And then in 2023, objection letters were dispatched to around 600 school districts in Ohio by um, the Freedom from Religion Foundation, um, expressing those concerns about the endorsement of LifeWise Academy um, and their classes. And then in 2023 as well, Parents Against LifeWise was formed by parents who had uh, seen detrimental um, detrimental effects for their children who did not participate in the program. Um, and initially, they raised awareness about um, increased bullying, um, unsupervised study hall during LifeWise programming, and disruptions that occurred to curriculum and, um, you know, lack of background checks. Uh, there was also, um, they found that one of the LifeWise worker was a former teacher whose license um, was revoked on allegations of sexting with a minor. Um, and LifeWise did fire the worker, um, but blame the worker for a lack of disclosure. Um, and and uh, so so obviously, right? They're not doing the, you know the background checks um, that the school districts are, um, or you know, searching through educator disciplinary database or educator profile that that school districts are prior to you know hiring people. Um, uh, a board of education uh, may adopt a policy, so permissive, right? The the proposed legislation would require this, but but currently it is permissive. 
Um, so they can adopt a policy that authorizes a student to be excused from school to attend a release time course in religious instruction. Um, all of the following have to, to, to be included in that policy. The student's parent or guardian has to give written consent. The sponsoring entity uh, maintains those attendance records and makes them available to the school district um, the student attends. Uh, transportation to and from the place of instruction, including transportation for students with disabilities, is the complete responsibility of either the, the sponsoring entity, the parent, the guardian, or the student. Um, the sponsoring, sponsoring entity must make provisions for and assume liability for those students. Um, no public funds may be expended and no public school personnel uh, may be involved in providing that re religious instruction. Uh, the student has to assume, the student assumes responsibility then for any missed schoolwork. So while in attendance in a release time course, um, a, a student shall not be considered absent from school. Uh, the student may be released or may not be released from a core curriculum subject course to attend this, uh, to attend release time. Um, and for, for high school student or a student can earn up to two units of high school credit for their participation, um, but it must evaluate courses based on purely secular criteria that are substantially the same criteria used to evaluate, evaluate similar non-public high school courses for purposes of determining whether to award credit for such courses to a student transferring from a non-public high school to a public high school. So liability consideration, the statute does provide immunity from damages in a civil, in a civil action for injury um, and, and also incorporates RC two, chapter 2744 of the revised code um, immunity may also be available. So um, does provide protection from the, for the schools and districts for allowing this, um, for having this policy um, with that extra layer of, of immunity. Uh, so, as I talked about earlier during our student data privacy, we're going to talk a little bit about addressing cyber attacks and cyber attacks is something that, you know, more and more school districts are experiencing, um, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, the ransomware is what we hear a lot about, um, you know, when, when, um, when, when data from the school districts or data from a company is compromised um, and uh, a lot of times the computer systems are locked down until a, um, uh, a school or a district or the company pays the 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 fee or the the ransom, not a fee, uh, the ransom for um, for to release that data. So um, when we have these uh, cyber attacks and and uh, data breaches, right? Um, Ohio Revised Code Section uh, one three or thirteen forty seven point one two really comes into play. Um, and as you'll remember, right, this applies to school districts, um, and, and all of our technology providers now are required to assist the school district in providing that information, um, but it requires a school district that owns computerized data that includes personal information to disclose any breach of uh, the security of the system to any resident of the state, so any resident of Ohio, whose personal information was or, or reasonably is believed to have been accessed and acquired by an unauthorized person, if that access um, causes or reasonably, or reasonably is believed will cause a material risk of identity theft or other fraud to that resident. Now, uh, personal, or personal information is specifically defined, um, and it does kind of have a more narrow meaning. Um, and it means an individual's name consisting of the first name or first initial, last name, in combination with and linked to any one or more of the following data elements. Social security number, a driver's license number or state identification card number, and an account number or credit card or debit card number. So um, this statute really comes into play when we have those two pieces of information together um, and we have a data breach. 
So if the required notifications uh, under this statute exceed 1,000 residents of the state, then the district is required to notify without unreasonable delay all consumer reporting agencies that compile and maintain files on consumers. So, you know, your, your typical consumer reporting agencies that we think about. Um, so these notifications must be made no later than 45 days following its discovery of the notification of the breach. Um, the notification may be made through a written notice um, an electronic notice, but only if the state's agency or agency of a political subdivision, so the school district, right, primary, only if their primary method of communication with the resident to whom the disclosure must be made is by electronic means. So essentially, you can send an email notification if you typically communicate with that in individual by email. Um, or a telephone notice, right? So if your data breach is, um, you know, smaller um, and you only have a handful of individuals to notify, you can pick up the phone and, and call those individuals. Um, so if the district does not have sufficient contact information to provide the required notice, right? Maybe it's students from 15 years ago and we don't have good contact information for them. Or if that cost of providing the notice would exceed $250,000 or the number of residents exceeds 500,000 individuals, then um, it's got some alternative um, notices that can be provided um, or an alternative notice that can be provided, but it's got to include all of the following. So an electronic mail notice, if, um, if we have that, that email address for the resident, um, conspicuous posting of the disclosure notice on the state or uh, on the school district's website, um, and then notification to a major media outlet to the extent that the cumulative total of readership, viewing audience, or listening audience of all the outlets so notified equals or exceeds 75% of the population of the state. So the major media outlet has to be you know, pretty significant so that it gets to everybody in, in the state. In terms of FERPA, um, so according to guidance provided by the U.S. Department of Education, FERPA itself does not contain specific breach notification requirements. Um, it protects the confide confidentiality of those education records um, and requires that um, the districts record each incidence of data disclosure. So if you have a data breach of FERPA information, then, um, then we need to be recording in the student file that data disclosure. And that's found in, um, in 34 CFR 99.32. And then um, the preamble for, for FERPA includes uh, that 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 FERPA essentially has no authority to require agencies um, or educational institutions to issue a direct uh, notice to a parent or student um, upon the unauthorized disclosure of education records. It only requires that that those the 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 records be or, or that information of the data disclosure be recorded. So it specifically addresses the fact that this is not permissive that the that FERPA does not have the authority to do that. Um, so some new litigation, um, I'm sure most of us ha have heard about the state versus Columbus Public Schools, which was filed on um, September 5th of, so just uh, you know a week ago now in the Ohio Supreme Court um, by the Ohio Attorney General, Dave Yost, um, in, in uh, Yost is seeking a writ of mandamus to require um, the district to comply with student transportation requirements of Chapter 3327 of the Revised Code. So essentially what's happening here is Columbus City has all of these students who they're required to transport um, and they are um, notifying students um, or they have notified students and parents um, of uh, impracticality of, of transporting those students. Um, and the the Ohio Attorney General's position is that they didn't do this in accordance with the statute and you know which requires 30 days you know prior to the school district starting um, but with all of these different 
or excuse me, the school starting. Um, but with all of these different, you know, schools that are involved, um, community schools and, and private schools that are involved in this, that that point is a kind of a move, moving um, target for each individual student. Um, so, you know, they're trying to require that the city uh, of Columbus um, or the city, I'm sorry, the school district for, for Columbus City uh, be mandated to transport those students um, so that's one to to keep an eye on as the ongoing kind of transportation issues um, that school districts are facing um, continues. The the other court case um, to keep an eye on is Garrity versus the Jackson Local School District, um, which is in our Eastern uh, Division uh, or the Northern District of Ohio Eastern Division. Um, so there's been some summary judgment motions by both parties and they've largely denied the, the summary judgment um, in those cases, but it's but the case is about requiring teachers to use students' preferred names. Um, there are five causes of action, free speech retaliation, compelled speech in violation of the First Amendment, free exercise of religion under the First Amendment, free exercise of religion under the Ohio Constitution, and then due process clause violations of the 14th Amendment. So really this gets down to a teacher who um, who resigned over uh, the, the use of a student's preferred name and being required to do that as part of her uh, part of her job. Um, and so, you know, as we are, you know, kind of waiting on the new Title IX regulations to be worked out in Ohio um, and some of this you know, kind of intermingling of, of student identity, um, this is another case to, 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 to keep an eye on. And so um, I'm going to turn it over to David then, who's going to talk about the Ohio Auditor of State's uh, levy guidance. Thank you, Aaron. Um, for the last part of our webinar, um, I'm going to be talking about the Auditor of State's uh, levy guidance from August of last year. Um, if you haven't um, already looked at that levy guidance, um, I recommend that you do. It's in the form of um, question and answers. Um, and also um, it gives uh, helpful examples about what, what is permitted and what is not. Um, and also it makes uh, the, it, it, it includes the auditor's recommendations um, for best practices. So I'm gonna be talking about uh, what board employees can and cannot do, um, what board members can and cannot do, um, what use of district resources are permissible or prohibited by um, either pro or anti-levy groups, and the, the use of outside um, consulting firms and, and surveys. So what, um, what you'll notice during this talk is that um, the permissible conduct for board employees is generally more limited than what is permitted for board members. And, and this is going to be especially true of your higher level um, board administrators who don't have specified contractual hours, because the underlying theme of the, the Auditor of State's levy guidance is that um, neither a board employee nor a board member um, can advocate for a levy uh, when they're being paid by the board um, to perform work. And so, as, we'll, as you'll see in, in the course of this presentation, um, it's easier for a, a board member to um, you know, to avoid that pitfall than it is for a board a board employee to to avoid that prohibition, um, and certainly it's it's the most difficult for a higher level administrator who doesn't have specified contractual hours. So what what is important? Um, this is both for board members and for for administrators is that you need to adjust your expectations um, and and be mindful that you're not requesting. Um, an employee um, or or another board member um, to um, uh, to take action that is going to be prohibited um, in, in support of a levy. So um, here's uh, our, our first kind of black letter rule: um, board employees, from the superintendent on down, 
um, cannot advocate for or against a levy or a bond issue during any time that the employee is being paid by the board to perform their job duties. It's important to remember the last part of this um, sentence. Um, it's, it's when the employee is getting paid by the board to perform their job duties. So as we'll see, if an employee is getting compensated by the board by using sick time or a paid personal day, um, that is acceptable if, if, if the employee has, has asked for and received a sick day um, or, or a personal day, then they can advocate for the levy during that day. But if they're being paid by the board to perform job duties, they cannot advocate for the levy. The concept of advocacy, um, consider that to be very broad. Um, it's any action that is meant to convince someone how to vote. Um, and it's important also to realize that advocacy includes um, verbal speech, written speech, um, but also simply the wearing of a pin that, that might have a symbol that's being used by a pro-levy group or, or that has text that's, that's, that advocates for the levy. Um, it can be a sticker that's worn on a shirt, or it can be clothing, a t-shirt or a baseball cap that has a pro or anti-levy slogan. That's all advocacy. And so uh, neither a board employee or a board member can wear a pin or a sticker or clothing with a, with a levy slogan when they're being paid by the board to perform work. Um, as I've already mentioned, it's, it's easier for a board employee who has set work hours to avoid uh, running afoul of, of this levy activity. Um, but, but even an employee who has set work hours, um, a teacher or a non-teaching employee, um, still has to be careful about not advocating for the levy um, when they're representing the board in any capacity um, or performing job duties. So a, 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 um, you know, a common example that I give um, is a teacher who has a supplemental contract um, uh, and is being a, an, a, an athletic coach or, or is um, you know, uh, controlling the, uh, a student performance after hours. Um, if that employee um, has a supplemental contract and is performing duties pursuant to the supplemental contract, they need to avoid um, any advocacy for or against the levy. Um, a board employee, it is permissible for a board employee to be a member of the levy of a levy committee. Um, a board employee is permitted to attend and participate in levy committee meetings as a levy committee member. Uh, but, but again, only during times that the employee is not being compensated by the board to perform work. We will see that there's an exception to this, um, but, but this is the general rule. Um, if the employee is being paid by the, the board to perform work, um, then they, they, they should not be attending or participating in a levy committee meeting. actually go back. Um, so I, I alluded to this earlier, um, but for for someone like an administrator who doesn't have set hours, what is really required for that administrator to ever uh, advocate for the levy um, because you know there's an understanding that that administrator's job duties, you know maybe 24 hours a day, seven days a week, is for that administrator to ask for and receive either vacation time um, or, or, or paid personal time. Um, if, if the administrator does that, uh, then on that vacation day or on that personal day, the administrator um, is not expected to be performing work for the board and, and they can advocate for a levy at that time. Um, so again, don't ask an administrator or another employee who doesn't have specified work hours um, to join a levy committee um, or attend levy committee meetings to advocate for the levy. Um, just as a point of emphasis, employees who don't have specified work hours cannot advocate for a levy um, unless they've requested and received time off from work. 
Um, so here's here's an exception. Um, it, it is permissible for a board employee, um, even while they're being compensated by the board to perform work. So, uh, for example, a, a treasurer or a superintendent um, who has not requested or received a vacation day or or a personal day, um, that that employee um, is is permitted. Um, to provide factual, neutral, and accurate information about a levy uh, or bond issue, school finances, and importantly, um, how, how the levy or bond issue passage or failure is going to affect um, district operations. So um, it, it is permissible as part of that factual, neutral, and accurate information provision um, to to discuss the consequences um, of what's gonna what's gonna be cut if the levy fails that that is permissible um, again the, the the important phrase is you need to be factual neutral and and provide accurate information so in this uh, situation um, we can have it's permissible for a board employee to appear at a public meeting or even a levy committee meeting while that employee is being paid to perform district work um, but only again to provide factual neutral and accurate information about the levy um, but but again that includes stating the consequences if the levy fails um, but but again this this can be a a, a thin line um, that, that the board employee doesn't want to cross. And it, it, you can easily imagine during the course of such a public appearance, um, it, 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 it's entirely possible that the board employee may unintentionally, you know, pass over the line um, so into advocacy, which, which, which is not permitted. Um, so because this is, this is really a dangerous situation for the board employee um, who is, um, you know, intending to just provide neutral and factual information about the levy. Um, it's a dangerous situation where that employee could easily cross over into impermissible advocacy. The auditor of state in their guidance um, says that, that really the best practice is not to have any board employee um, attend any public appearances or levy committee meetings and really leave that to board members um, because uh, as we'll see a board member is permitted to appear at such meetings generally and not only provide factual and accurate information but also to advocate for the levy. Um, a board employee may on his or her own time using non-district equipment and at their own expense the employee's own expense compose and send a letter or an email supporting the levy. Um, but the auditor state says that teachers and coaches, this, these are the two um, types of employees that the auditor state focuses on, teachers and coaches should not sign the letter um, indicating their official capacity. So, so just sign it as, as John Doe or Jane Doe um, and, and leave off the fact that that you know you're you're the volleyball coach or you're a teacher at the district, um, and, and really my our advice is that administrators should follow the same rule. Um, you know you can obviously sign your name to the letter to the editor, um, but but leave off the fact that that you're the superintendent or, or the treasurer, for instance. Um, board members, um, as I've alluded to, um, have a lot more freedom. So. Um, board members may advocate for or against a levy or a bond issue. Um, that's the general rule. The only exception is they can't do it during the board meeting. Um, so it's considered that a board member is being compensated for their attendance at the board meeting. So when they're being compensated for their time to perform, perform work as a board member, they cannot advocate for the levy. Um, but either before that board meeting begins or after it ends, and at any other day that there's not a, a board meeting um, and the board member is not at the board meeting, um, that board member can advocate for the levy. That, that's perfectly permissible. Um, the Auditor of State says that board members may always explain why they voted in favor of putting a levy or a bond issue on the ballot. And this is true even at a board meeting. Um, and in fact, the auditor of state says 
that board members have both the right and the responsibility to their constituency to explain and support their vote to place a levy or a bond on the ballot. So this can be done by a board member at any time, including at a board meeting. Um, a board member um, at a board meeting, therefore, may explain why he or she voted to, to to place the levy on the ballot. And this, again, it, it exclude and it, it includes, I'm sorry, it, it includes um, stating the consequences um, of the levy's failure. Um, so it's interesting um, from a, a legal and, a, and a, a layperson's point of view that, that the auditor of state includes stating the consequences of the levy's failure as, oh no, that's not at all trying to convince someone how to vote. Um, but, but so you can do that, a board member can do that, um, but, um, but the board member can't take uh, any step more explicit than stating the consequences of the levy's failure to, to perhaps influence how someone might vote on the levy. So here are um, a, a permitted and non-permitted um, example. Um, a board member says at a meeting or otherwise, I voted to place the levy on the ballot because the district needs additional funds to maintain our high school busing program. And without those funds, the board will need to eliminate high school busing. Um, that's permissible for a board member to say at any time, um, including at a board meeting. Um, what is not permitted for a board member to do is to add um, this last sentence in the second bullet point, um, that, that if you want us, the board, to be able to continue to provide hus busing to high school students, you're going to need to vote for the levy. Um, the board member is not permitted to say that at a board meeting, uh, but again, the board member can say that in, in any other context, just not at a board meeting. Board members may also be members of a levy committee, committee um, and may attend and participate at levy committee meetings, either as a board member or a member of the public. Um, and again, they can the board member can advocate for the levy um, at those meetings. Uh, but 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 again, remember the the prohibition that this cannot be done in conjunction with a board meeting. So in the 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 perhaps unusual situation where um, there might be part of a board meeting where the levy committee meeting um, is is also involved. Um, you know that that's that's a, a mixing of roles that really um, you know should not occur. Um, for use of district resources, um, the district's website may contain factual, neutral, and accurate information about the levy or bond issue, um, including um, what are some of the um, consequences of, of the levy failing that, that the board has, has discussed as being possible or, or, or that will be implemented. Um, so again, this factual, neutral, accurate information can be on the board website, um, but the website should not include um, any text either with that presentation of factual and neutral, and neutral information or anywhere else on the district website that appears to advocate for the levy. So the auditor of state in this part of the guidance focuses on avoiding the use of slogans um, that, that are used um, by the levy committee or could be interpreted as, as advocacy for passing the levy, such as support our schools or, or keep our schools strong. That, that crosses the line into impermissible advocacy. Um, so, so it's permissible for the, the district website to have financial information about the district in conjunction with a levy campaign, but the auditor state says that really the best practice is for that type of neutral, factual financial information to be provided to the public on the website on a regular basis, such as annually, um, not just in those years or, or in the run up to an election where a levy or bond issue is on the ballot. Um, a, a board of education may permit any group, including a levy committee, um, to use its premises for meetings, for example, 
um, as long as the board allows other groups to use its premises. Um, this obviously has to include anti-levy groups. So if you're going to let a pro-levy group use a classroom for a meeting um, after after hours, uh, if an anti-levy group requests the same, then, then you need to allow the anti-levy group to use, use your premises too. It's important no matter what type of group um, you're allowing to use um, your premises um, to take a look at your policy and guidelines to see whether or not a fee is charged and whether the outside group has to provide any type of liability insurance. Um, certain types of board equipment are permitted to be used, but other types are not. So a board of education is permitted to, uh, to allow um, a levy committee to use um, equipment such as projectors, telephones, computers um, in, in, to advance the levy um, if the board allows other groups to use such equipment, uh, but only during times when the equipment is not being used for educational purposes um, and the use of that equipment, um, if permitted, has to be in conformance with any restrictions in board policy. So that's the general rule about board equipment, but there are some important exceptions to it. Um, it it's permissible to allow a, a levy committee um, to use the board's postage meter um, if the board allows other groups to use the postage meter. Um, and if the levy committee um, reimburses the board for the cost of postage. Um, so again, if, if this is permitted under your policy and practice, um, if you allow a levy committee to use your postage meter, um, you may get a request from an anti-levy committee to do the same thing. And you need to allow those two types of groups to use your postage meter uh, on, in this, with the same uh, restrictions. Um, it's important to remember that that if a, if the board does allow a levy committee or anyone else to use um, the board's postage meter, it is not permissible for that group to use the board's reduced bulk rate postage. Um, that that is um, that the auditor state just points out that that actually is a violation of, of U.S. Postal Service regulations. Um, it is not permissible for um, the board to allow uh, uh, an outside group, a levy committee or an anti-levy committee to use the district's internal um, mail system to send home literature uh, about the levy um, uh, to, to employees or to students. Um, and this is true even if the levy committee or the anti-levy committee um, is completely financially responsible for the production of the literature. Um, so if a Pro levy committee comes to you and with a, with a bunch of uh, one page handouts and wants you to stick those um, into student backpacks or put them in employees mailboxes. Um, you, you're you must tell them no uh, that that's not permitted. Um, likewise, it's not permissible for the board to allow a levy committee to use the district's phone system. To, to make phone calls um, to parents so that that's not permitted. Um, it's important that you not allow um, the storage of levy campaign materials. Most commonly, this comes up in the context of yard signs. Um, yard signs and other campaign materials are not permitted to be stored on district premises, and, and you're, you're not permitted to distribute materials from district premises. So I advised the district uh, in the past, um, they, they had a practice of um, allowing Pro levy uh, yard signs to be placed in the the atrium just outside of the of the the school office, and sometimes um, when when parents were lined up to pick up their students, um, an administrator would go out to the parent pickup line uh, with some yard signs and and offer them to parents. Uh, neither one of those types of activities is permissible. Um, if you have any yard signs or other levy campaign materials in your building, um, please immediately ask the levy committee to come and pick them up. Um, and um, someone such as an administrator who doesn't have set work hours should not be going out um, at the end of the school day to the parent pickup line and handing out any type of campaign material to the parents who are waiting to pick up their students. Um, somewhat inter interestingly enough, it is permissible to allow a levy committee to place a pro-levy sign 
on the front yard of the school. Um, if you um, if you do that, it must be in accordance with board policy on such on such signs. Your board policy may or may not allow it. Um, if your board policy allows it and the levy committee wants to put a pro levy sign on the front yard, um, you can let them. Um, you don't have to, but you can let them. Um, but again, just understand that if if you allow a pro levy sign on the school's front yard, um, you might get a request from an anti levy person or committee to put anti levy signs um, on the front yard. And and if you've allowed pro levy signs, then you have to allow anti levy signs as well. Um, the board is permitted to sell advertising space, such as on an electronic sign, a scoreboard, or in the fall sports program, to a pro levy committee. Um, to, to place a pro-levy advertisement, um, as long as it's in accordance with board policy. Um, but again, you need to treat anti-levy committee um, advertisements the same. So if, if, uh, if there's space left on the program for an anti-committee or an anti-levy committee advertisement, uh, then you have to let that committee place an advertisement to, to the same extent that, you, that you've allowed the pro-levy committee to do it. Um, it's it's recommended by the auditor of state that that either a pro or anti levy advertisement should contain a disclaimer that the advertisement is paid for by whatever the name of the group is that's placing the ad and is paid for it and that no public funds were used. So so the board can require that disclaimer on on any type of advertisement that's placed by a pro or anti levy committee. The board is not permitted to conduct a survey of community members, either directly or by using a consulting firm um, that, that is meant to garner the likelihood of community support for a levy or a bond issue um, if, it, if it were to be placed on the ballot. That, that's not permitted. Um, a levy committee or a political action committee can do that, um, but the board cannot. Um, what the board is permitted to do is to either conduct its own direct survey or hire an outside consulting group to conduct a survey to determine um, the community's perceptions about district finances, the quality of its facilities and programs, and whether there's a need for additional specific facilities or programs. So again, this is a little bit of a of a a thin line, but that type of survey activity by the board, either directly or indirectly, is permitted. Um, and it's it's meant to allow the board, I suppose, to um, to get feedback from the community about whether additional funds you know might be needed to expand programs or facilities. Um, but doing it in this fairly innocuous way, um, where you're not tying it to um, a, a, a proposed levy campaign. So if if the board um, you know hires an outside firm to conduct such a survey, um, or the board wants to conduct its own survey like this directly, um, you just you know you have to be careful that that none of the questions are designed or could be uh, interpreted to to be designed to um, gauge com the community support for a levy or a bond. So you can ask about the need for additional facilities or programs, but you can't tie that to the need for additional funds to, to fund those facilities or programs. Um, it's always best um, to have um, an opinion letter from your legal counsel about activity that you've engaged in. So in the event, if after you engage in the conduct, you're challenged that it was impermissible, um, you can at least produce something in writing um, from board counsel um, that is, it needs to be dated from before you engage in the activity, um, stating that the activity was permitted. Um, so, you know, part of this exercise um, is also to create a paper trail from you to board council, asking board council very specifically, um, what exactly do you want to be able to do? Is it permissible or, or, or impermissible? You need to give a complete description about what you want to do, and that description needs to be accurate about what activity you're contemplating. Um, and so, so 
That's the first part of the procedure. Um, completely and accurately state what activity you would like to um, engage in and asking your board council if it's permitted or not. Then you get a letter back from board council before you engage in the activity saying activities A and B are permissible, but activity C is not. Um, then what's important also is that then your activity should be limited only to the activity that the board council said was permissible. So if board council has said activity A and B are permissible, um, activity C is not, then go ahead. You can, with some level of comfort, engage in activities A and B, but certainly don't engage in activity D that wasn't mentioned to board council and that board council um, has not approved. At this point in time, um, we're going to ask that the, um, the panelists rejoin us, and we are um, going to um, take a look at the questions um, that have been placed into the, uh, the Q&A box. And so um, I see that we, we have a few questions here. Um, it, Aaron, it, I don't it appears like the first question is related to the notification about um, data privacy. Um, do you want to address that or shall I? I, I can take that. Thanks, David. Uh, so uh, the, the question is, does this have to be communicated this year by October 24th, 2024, or does the first notification need to occur by August 1st of 2025? So I would say that the legislation does not take effect until August, October 24th. And so the first notification that's required under the law would be August 1st of 2025. However, you know, you, you might want to consider, um, you know, sending that, you know, discussing with your legal counsel and consider sending that notification this year um, if if you determine that that's the, you know, way to go. I, I, I think essentially, Nothing's preventing you from sending that notification and, and giving your parents and students the information, you know, when it becomes effective might be a good idea. The next question was um, just a, a general question about whether this presentation would be shared. And yes, it will be. Um, I, I believe that at some point after the webinar, you'll be getting um, an email that allows you to um, to download and, and save a copy of, of our PowerPoint. Then there was a, a question about um, the requirement in the religious um, instruction um, release about the organization um, who's providing that instruction having to um, assume um, liability and the fact that the school board is immune from liability for any injury that happens during um, the religious instruction and certainly transportation to and from. Um, but there was a comment that maybe, Aaron, you can address that apparently on LifeWise, LifeWise's forms, th there's language in there where they're attempting to, um, to, to cause the parent to uh, release and waive any liability on the, on the point of, of LifeWise. Yeah, you know, I, I've heard this too, um, that that's included on their forms. Um, you know, from the school district standpoint, nothing that that LifeWise does in their contract or their agreement with the, the parents or the students um, will affect the, the school's liability, right? And to the extent, you know, that that's contrary to, to Ohio law may not be enforceable. I, I know, David, I, I don't know if you have any kind of further thought on that, but but I think the the law is pretty specific in terms of um, you know the the requirement that they assume the liability. Yeah, you know my my initial impression, and obviously you know for the audience, check with your your board counsel about how you want to handle this. If if you end up with a lifewise form that that um, that attempts to waive their liability, my initial inclination would be to go back to lifewise and say, I'm sorry. Um, that that's not permitted under the law, and and if you likewise want to provide religious uh, instruction during a release time to our students, you need to submit uh, a new form and and remove that attempt to release liability. That that would be my my way to handle it. Um, but again, don't don't take my word as as legal advice. 
Um, we're not supposed to be giving our audience legal advice in this context. So, but if you have a concern about that attempt to waive uh, LifeWise's liability, talk to your legal counsel and see if that's the tack that you want to take. And David and Aaron, I'll, I just want to pop in. I do know that this, in fact, is happening. And so I would encourage you, if you're participating in this program, to have your legal counsel review it. Um, and if you're looking at participating in this program, that your legal counsel has been involved so that uh, all of the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and that there's not an issue of who was liable when for these children should something unfortunate occur. And then the last question that I see, I think this is Aaron back to you on um, House Bill 29 and, and student um, data privacy. Mm -hmm. um, are, are, Aaron, would you like to address that question? Yeah, so the question is about um, filtering and whether that would be permissible under um, House Bill 29 and, and the new student data privacy. Um, laws and and I think you know filtering doesn't actually involve the the you know it's it's, it's definitely on a different frame than electronically accessing right if you're just having a computer system or a program running in the background of your software that doesn't allow certain um, that doesn't allow the computer to access certain websites um, not only is that going to be you know in compliance with with federal law and that the um, Child um, Enforcement Protection Act or Child Information Protection Act that I talked about earlier, right? Um, not only is that going to be in compliance with that, if if you're subjected to that, which I'm, I'm, you know, fairly certain that most school districts in Ohio do participate in the E-rate program, um, so you do have that kind of um, backing. But but I think you know there's there's probably a distinction to be made there between electronic electronically accessing monitoring and filtering right and the, the the legislator chose not to use the word filtering um in that uh the question uh, also goes on to, to ask also teacher dashboards that include remote viewing of laptops um so I think this one is probably going to be more along the lines of electronically accessing and monitoring. And, you know, depending on what it's being used for, maybe there might be an exception for that, but but definitely something that needs to be considered, whether that's permissible under under that, you know, new requirement. And if there are any exceptions, right, there's the exception for exam monitor, you know, for, for proctoring an exam. And if that's the situation, you know, maybe that exception is going to apply. Um, but I, I don't know that the blanket use of teacher dashboards to monitor, you know, the students in the classroom, um, you know, use of their personal device or use of those devices is going to be permissible under that, that change. Now, at the same time, you could probably, you know, the, the educator could, you know, visually look at it. I don't, I don't know that that's electronically accessing or electronically monitoring in that instance. And so, you know, I, I think just that it's it's definitely not as effective, right, um, for the purposes of ensuring that the students are, you know, on task. But I don't know, David, if you had any thoughts on that either. No, I I, I would agree with that. It's um. Yeah, the, the, the teacher's activity of monitoring uh, a Chromebook in the classroom, um, that I, I, I don't think is affected um, by, by the new legislation. Are there any, I don't see any other questions um, in the, the Q&A box. So um, we have a little bit more time. So if anyone has any questions, um, type them in. Uh, here in the next uh, few seconds. And otherwise, um, if I don't see any more questions, I'd like to thank all of you for attending. We know that all of you are busy. Um, and, and again, we also hope to see all of you uh, back on December 18th um, for, the, um, for the second part, or I'm sorry, for the last part of our webinar.